In teaching, it's good to have a doctrine that you are expounding, but it is also good to uh, have illustrations of that doctrine so that it will be fully understood. And in, in many classes, the only thing they can give you is doctrine but without experience. And then without the experience, you've got a doctrine, but you're not sure it'll work because you ha doesn't have any experimental uh, relationships to it. And the purpose of this specific lesson is just that, not only to present a doctrine or a truth, but to, ex to present an experience of, of what happened in the removal of an alien entity uh, from some person. In the book of 1 Peter, in chapter 5 and verse 8, the, the man of God, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said, uh, be, be sober. Now, now he wasn't think, thinking or speaking of alcoholism, or alcoholic drink. Uh, there are people whose minds never settle down. They're giddy. Everything's a joke. And he said, if you're going to understand the deeper things of God, you're going to have to get that nonsense out of your brain and get sense into it. So he said, now be sober. Then he said, be vigilant. Uh, that word relates uh, to watching. Uh, uh, yeah, we can be like an ostrich and hide our heads in the soil, you see, and, and never come up with truth. And, and we won't know what's going on around us. There can be many uh, tremendous events taking place, but because we are not watchful, then they don't relate to us. And so he says, now, 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 now don't be stupid, don't be silly, uh, 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 be sober. Then he says, and be watchful, be watchful. Why? Because you have an adversary. Put a little circle around the word adversary. Now, whether you like it or not, you got him. You may say, I don't want to fight. He says, fine. So he just boxes you one, you see. And so it doesn't matter whether you want to or not. You're in a war whether you like it or not. And, and, and if you don't like it, he likes that better. Then he just does all the beating. And it's on you that he does it. You have an adversary, and your adversary is a devil. Now, what does the devil do? It says he goes as a roaring lion. Now, a roaring lion is a king of the jungle. Uh, a, 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 a lion in the nighttime can wake up the whole jungle and he can get everything nervous. He can get everything in the jungle nervous till they're running this way, running that way, running crazy, you know. Uh, the, the lion is the master of the situation. And so he is a roaring lion, a disturber of the peace, a, an agitator that gets everything agitated, that he goes about seeking whom he may devour. Now, his, his mission is one, destroying destroying you, destroying the Word, destroying God's work. Uh, he has one mission, devouring. In today's lesson, I wish to uh, reveal to you a person that I knew uh, very, very well called Clarita uh, Villanueva. Now, she had two entities bite her. I'd, I'd like to say that this uh, uh, phenomena happened in a prison, a Billy Bid prison, one of the world-famous prisons, over 300 years used as a prison. Many people died in that prison. Uh, no doubt that prison is full of evil entities there. And while she was in prison for being a harlot, uh, two entities bit her. Now, it was the doctors that took care of her, not preachers. And for three weeks it happened. Now, the doctors never did see the thing. They saw the effects of it. And so we will, we will go into that. Clarita, at the time of this tragedy, the time of this sorrow, uh, was 17 years of age. She was a little country girl and, and uh, had come into the city as a harlot to make money. Clarita did not remember ever having a father. She was told by her mother that he died when she was two or three years old. So she never knew a father. She did not know exactly how he died or whether he deserted the mother. She thought that he had died. Uh, her mother was a spiritist. Uh, she made her living as a spiritist. She was a fortune teller by her vocation. The girl was brought up watching her mother do seances and, and communicating with the dead and telling sinful people what they could expect in the future by clairvoyance. And of course, her mother would laugh at people, take money from them and say, well, I made some more money today. And so it was a game of, 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 of not being sincere, you know, of insincerity toward the people that the mother was taking money from. She grew up that way. But when Clarita was 12 years of age, her mother died. She did not have any in the immediate family to take care of her, to, to raise her. And so at the age of 12, uh, through some women in the area, she became a vagabond and she became a harlot. They told her how to make money. 
So Clarita fell into the hands of harlots when only 12 years of age and was soon making her living by selling her body as a prostitute in the, in, in the areas down, down away from Manila, two or three hundred miles from Manila. The harlots told her and showed her how to handle men, how to get money for her services. And so she became a public harlot. Clarita worked her way from her island home to the capital city of Manila. Now, now, anybody in business in the Philippines is going to work his way to Manila. That's where the center of everything is. It's where the center of money and everything else. It's the big city. And it was also a hiding place for the, for the, the local harlots became her teachers, and there were more men to seduce. And so that was her game. By the time she was 17 years of age, she was frequenting bars, uh, uh, taverns, and, and finding men there uh, to commit adultery with. She was living a gay life by soliciting men for harlotry. But one morning, at 2 o'clock in the morning, on the streets of downtown Manila, Clarita made the mistake of offering her services to a plainclothes police officer. He was dressed in plain clothes, and she didn't know he was a police. The policeman called for a vehicle, and Clarita was taken to the ancient Billy Bid prison, used as a city jail. So that's where we find her in jail. Billy Bid had already been a prison for 300 years. It was built by the Spanish. It was used by the Japanese. <clears throat> During the occupation of the Philippines, it's a place of torture for many generations. An awful, awful place. Two days, two days after she was incarcerated, the strangest phenomena to hit Bilibid Prison in 300 years struck her. This young harlot was bitten severely on her body by unseen and unknown alien entities. There were two. There was a huge monster-like spirit she said he must have been 10 foot tall. And then there was a smaller spirit. They sunk their fangs and teeth deep into her flesh, making indentations. Now, they could not be seen, remember that, and yet they could do physical things. They could bite her body. They, they would bite her neck, her back, her legs, her arms simultaneously. I mean, in one second, she, she was bit all over. It didn't bite none, and, and a minute later, bite again, and a minute later, bite again. Uh, it was a simultaneous thing. Bing! And she was bit everywhere at the same time. They would sink their teeth into her, into her body. A blood flowed underneath her skin, and, and uh, from the bruises, she would scream with horror and would faint. And, and then the guards would take her into the hospital where she would remain for some time getting over it. Now, the guards and the medics would come running to the women's division of the prison. The other female inmates would point to the writhing, tormented girl as she either laid on the floor or laid on a cot, one or the other. In the prison hospital, the doctors all declared that they had never seen in their medical experience anything like it. Most of the doctors were trained in the United States of America uh, universities. These strange demonic bitings began to happen daily. They got in the newspapers every day. They were on the front page every day. It baffled Everyone who saw it. Dr. Laura appealed for help uh, through the media and, and permitted many to view the strange phenomenon. Uh, he was a real scientist. He could have thrown her into a, in, into a solitary prison. That would have been the last of it. She had just died there. But he was a real scientist. Now, I got to know him real well for a number of years. And, and Dr. Laura was a, what I would call a real scientist. He called in Filipino doctors, Chinese doctors, American doctors. Uh, he, he called in university professors. Uh, he called in anybody and everybody to view it and to see it uh, so that they, would, that they would know about it. So it was a phenomenon uh, that was not hidden. It was one that was seen by, by so many. The newspapers, radio stations, magazines found it their kind of story. Man, they had a good story. Even the cartoonists were drawing pictures of the entities uh, from Clarita's description. She would tell them. The, the UPI and other world news services began to report the phenomenon worldwide. I have not been in any country in the world did not, that did not put this story on their front pages. When I went to Switzerland, uh, when, I, when, I went, when I went to France, when I went to Germany, when I went to England, uh, or to Canada, the United States, there was no country that had not put this phenomenon on their front pages. The, 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 the UPI had every day would broadcast it to the world what was happening there in Billy Bid Prison. And one doctor accused the girl uh, of only putting an act on in order to get publicity. Her story was on the front page of all the newspapers, magazines. She would see it, and Clarita would gaze at the doctor, and with her snake-like eyes, she said very slowly, you will die. He didn't feel anything at the moment, excepting, uh, 
The following day, the doctor expired without getting sick. He simply died. Fear struck the city. The girl was not only a harlot, but she was a witch who could speak curses upon human beings. The doctor was dead. No warning for his death. His heart stopped beating. He died with his clothes on. And then the chief jailer, uh, he had a confrontation with the girl, and he, he, he had kicked her for something she had done wrong. And, and uh, when she was rebelling, and Clarita looked at him in cold, inhuman hate and said, you will die. Within four days, he was dead and buried. And so that was the second one that she had cursed, and they died. When I personally walked into Billy Bid Prison, the funeral cortege uh, moved out, and the prison guards had paid their last respects to their chief. I saw the, the, the funeral procession of the head jailer being taken out to the cemetery the day that I walked into Billy Bid Prison. So I had a relationship with the desk that had taken there, and they told me how they had happened. And Dr. Laura, the chief medical officer, they had six of these medical officers there, and he was the chief of them, were deeply concerned. They had a prisoner who certainly was not crazy, they knew that, but who was wildly attacked by unseen entities and bitten deeply in all parts of her body by creatures no one could see. And, and, and uh, I've never seen such a messed up bunch as when I found these people. He was afraid he would die himself, that this thing would kill him one day. And so there was fear on all sides. Who were these alien entities? Uh, the large one, she said, was like a monster in size. Black, hairy, had fangs that came down on, on each side of his, his mouth there. He had a set of buck teeth in the front. Rather than having front teeth, he had buck teeth all the way around. And that's what you would see uh, when, when the bruises were in her. You'd see buck teeth solid all the way around rather than sharp teeth in the front. The smaller entity was almost like a dwarf. Uh, he could climb up her body to bite the upper parts of her torso, or he would bite her. Uh, they always liked to bite where there was a lot of flesh, like on the back of her leg, in the back of her neck. Uh, they, they, would, they would bite deep in, into her. Dr. Laura and his assistant doctors called in all kinds of observers. They just wanted everybody to know about. They called in psychiatrists, they called in professors from the Four East University and the University of Santo Tomas where he was also a professor of legal medicine. Uh, no one had ever witnessed such strange and demonic behavior as they found in this girl. Also, they did not know who or what would be uh, the, the victim of her next curse. That was the thing that bothered the most. Who would she kill next? Uh, and, and so they, they sent out words everywhere. Come over and help us. Please help us. They got no help from anybody. They had 3,000 cables that came from heathen countries, not one from a Christian country. You see how we were asleep? You see how we were asleep? The, world, the word went all over the world. They got 3,000 cables, mostly from Japan and India, telling them what to do with a thing, with an invisible monster that would bite you. And they asked in Manila for somebody to come and help, somebody to come and help. <laughs> and the only one that turned up was the spiritist. And, and, and they said it was John Baptist that was biting her, so they threw them out. And I was the next one that came upon the scene. After three weeks, now this wasn't done just for one or two days, after three weeks of this torture, a radio reporter came to Billy Bid, taped a session uh, when the doctors were violently uh, struggling with this uh, demonized harlot. The reporter immediately released the story the same night on a local uh, radio station just after the 10 o'clock news, and this was where I first heard of it. I had not heard, had not read the newspapers. I did not know the two men were dead or anything. I only heard what was put on the, what, what was put on the radio, and it was, it was, it was like hell. It was a simply a terrible situation. The newspapers had given it front page covered, but I was busy building a church building, and was not reading newspapers. It is so easy to get so involved in what we call God's work, until we don't know what the devil is doing. And that's what the devil would like for you to do, to get so involved in taking care of your own little mission until he can do anything he wants to do. That's when it says to be, to be vigilant, that's what it means. See what he's doing in the world. Keep up with him. Know what he's doing and resist him and fight him in whatever he might be doing. That radio story so, so, so touched me that night that I stayed up the entire night and I was praying and weeping before God. I was interceding for the city and for the girl and for myself. I, I was living in a city that had a great need and I was not helping in the need. I was so busy building a church 
and doing my own little thing that I was not involved in the tragedy. The next morning, God spoke to me and told me to go to Bilibid and to pray for this demonized girl. I did not want to go, but God assured me that he had no one else in that city to send excepting me. Now, that was a, a very sad moment in my life. Three times the Lord asked me to go. The first time I responded, I said, well, now, wait a minute. I stayed up all night. You get somebody else to go. And he said, I don't have anybody else to go. And, and, and I said, well, I'm not a jail preacher. Get the Salvation Army to go. No, he said, there's not a jail preacher job here. And, and, and as I was getting ready to go to my uh, church that was being built, the Lord said, if you don't go, she'll die. And you're the only one I have in the whole city that knows how to deal with it. If you don't go, she will die. Now, there are times when if you don't obey God, whatever God wants done will never get done. It'll never get done if you refuse to do it. You're the only one that God has in that place that can do it. And if you refuse to do it, then God's work will never get done. There are times when God needs you. And when you hear lessons like this, he may need you more often than ever before. And if you refuse, you'll give account to God when you reach heaven. You'll give an account for the, for the way that you've handled the jobs that he, he said that you should do. Because I was a foreign in the Philippines, I went to the mayor's office and asked permission to see Clarita. I, I, I took with me my architect that knew him very well. He granted me this permission after denying it a couple of times. But he warned me that several had been injured by the girl as she had beat doctors until they were, had to be hospitalized. When that devil would hit her, she would be so furious until nobody could contain her at all. They had been injured by the girl and that at least two had been cursed and were already dead. And, uh, and that was the first I heard of that. So I went on that basis that I would not sue the government if I was hurt and that I, I would not complain if I was mistreated. And so I said, well, all right, I'll go. Now, the head doctor uh, of, of six physicians in Bilibid Prison, Dr. Mariano Lara, was skeptical, first of a foreign minister, of a foreign preacher, and, and, and other than any preacher uh, at all. He, just, he, he didn't know whether it would work at all. But this girl was brought into a special room where I was waiting with a lot of the news media, the foreign press, university professors, medical doctors, whom the doctor had invited over. Dr. Laura had had a good day of inviting people over. And as Clarita was being led into the room, she looked at all of them and said nothing. But when she saw me, she screamed violently. And she said, I hate you. Instantly, I, 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 I asserted, I know you hate me. I've come to cast you out. And that was the beginning of the confrontation. That's the way it all started. I didn't know what I was going to do until that moment. And then there was a raging battle with a girl blaspheming God, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Her eyes were burning like coals of fire and full of hate. She fainted, and I brought her back to with a slap upside the head. I commanded the evil spirit to loose her, and the miracle of the God came upon her, and she became released. She became relaxed. I, uh, uh, the joy of God came to her. Uh, uh, she smiled, and I said, uh, uh, is he gone? She said, yes, he's gone. I said, where is he gone? She said, he went out that way. He went out that way. He is gone. And, and the, the world press that was standing there, the local newspapers, magazines, radio, and so forth, uh, began to say all kinds of things. One, one, one of them says, the devil is dead. Uh, another said, devil loses round one. They didn't understand it. Uh, they, they thought we'd have 15 rounds, I guess. But they, they were the observers of it, and they were the ones that put it all in the newspaper. Dr. Lowry got so excited, uh, he, he took me over to the, to the office of the mayor, and when he walked into the mayor's office, he says, my God, mayor, the devil is dead. <laughs> I said, he may be a good doctor. He's a poor theologian. The devil is not dead. I said, the girl is healed that I came and talked to you about yesterday. It was the day before that I had asked his permission to go in and pray for her. And, and so... Uh, uh, that, that did it. The mayor said, anything that I have here, uh, you, any, anything, anything you want here at my place, uh, you can have it. And, and uh, I had never expected anything. I had never asked for anything. All I wanted to do was see the girl heal. I got the burden lying on the floor, and I heard her screaming and tearing and crying and fighting on the floor. Just because she was a human being, I was distressed by it. And I said, God, in a city where I live, the devil must not be permitted to tear anybody to pieces. And, and by praying all night, then God said, I had to go and to do the praying for her. 
So I went under the direct command of God. And, and then uh, when we began to pray for her before about 120, 125 witnesses, and none of them were Protestant at all, uh, uh, then, then they saw like a little human becoming a little animal becoming a human being. They saw the change, dramatic change. And in the whole being, they saw the change of a beautiful, lovely little girl uh, coming into being. And, and, and they, they were amazed. They, they, they had never dreamed of ever seeing anything like it. The mayor was so overcome by it, he, he, he put his arms around me and he says, uh, you, can have, uh, you can have anything that you want. And I, I, I didn't know at the moment, but he, he, he reminded me and I said, yeah, there are things I need, all right. He said, I said, I have, I have drawings in this city here uh, uh, for a building that I'm building. And I said, to tell you the truth, I, I have been building some of it without a permission because I didn't have enough oil money to get through your organization here. Well, he, he rung a bell and made a scream and, and in about 10 minutes, I had those plans, you know, for a large building that big. He sat there and stamped them and signed them. And as he handed them to me, he said, you're the first Protestant that ever did get anything free in this city. And he said, is there anything else you want? And I, I said, yes, yes, there, there really is. He said, what is it? I said, out in front of the great city hall. Now, this is one of the biggest city halls you've ever seen. It was about two blocks long and about four stories high. I mean, it was an enormous thousands of people worked in there, I guess. And right across the street was a, was a garden, was a park. I says, I would like to preach in Rojas Park across the street called the Sunken Gardens. I'd like to preach over there. He says, how long? No, I said, well, about six weeks. He said, that's a long time. I said, well, it'll take a long time to say all I've got to say. Well, he said, the girl's healed. You can have the park as long as you want it. And so we, we began to prepare for our great revival meeting. And, and the, the way God arranged it was so, was so magnificent. Without Gordon Lindsay in, in, uh, in Texas knowing what we were doing, he sent us thousands of colorful magazines with people healed in them, healing magazines. Without Oral Roberts knowing what I was doing over there, he sent me a film on healing with a projector and a screen and everything that went along with it. And so all this came just at the time the girl was healed. And, and then the, the newspapers there, uh, they didn't uh, get to see me, but they had to surmise most of it. So they decided I was a Methodist. So they put in their news articles that I was a Methodist missionary. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, the head of the Methodist church, the superintendent came out to see me and said, so you're a Methodist? You're operating without, without consulting with the headquarters here. And I said, no, I am not a, not a Methodist, not a Methodist. My mother was, but I'm not. He said, I didn't come for that. He says, I've come to get saved. And I said, all right. So he knelt at my feet and I laid my hands upon him and prayed for him and God came into his heart in a mighty way. I laid my hands on him and God filled him with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, now what shall we do? And when he said, we, I knew that we were partners. I said, you open up every, every church in this city for me to preach on them. And he did that. He opened up every church in the city for me to preach on them. And so I went to all these churches preaching, showing this film and giving out these magazines. And by the time we went into the park, the whole city was aflame and ablaze. The Methodist church there uh, put me on radio. They paid for the whole thing for 15 minutes after the evening news on a 50,000 watch station that covered the whole nation. And so every night, just after the evening news, I talked to the whole nation about what was happening in, in, in Manila. They came from the whole nation. They came from all over the nation. There wasn't a city that wasn't represented there coming to see the miracles that were happening in Manila. I mean, every kind of a miracle was taking place. And for 15 minutes every night, I just told you how many there were and what God was doing and told you to come. The crowds got up to be 40, 50, and 60 thousands of people. And God saved among those people 150,000 human beings. We had the greatest revival that country has ever known, either before that or since that or at any time. But the remarkable thing is this. It all came about through the deliverance of a little nobody, a little girl harlot in prison. And all these beautiful people, some of them in the highest rank of society, some of them in the very highest uh, rank of the whole society, had their lives changed and their hearts changed because a little girl was delivered. Now, that gives you the purpose of setting people free. We set them free, not only for them to be free, but we set them free to, to move nations for God. I was praying one day and the Lord spoke to me and said, I didn't heal that girl for you. And I said, well, thank you, Lord. 
says, I didn't heal her exactly for her. And I said, well, thank you, Lord. He says, I healed her to manifest my power to a whole nation. And that revival has never ceased. That revival has never quit. From that day until this day, they've had that revival surging and moving. And at this moment, that church in Manila is building a, a, new, a, new, a, a, a new sanctuary seating 8,500 people. And, and all the denominations have been blessed. All of them have been blessed. There aren't any that have not been blessed that had their hearts open to God because God gave that nation a mighty revival. And it all came about by a girl being healed by God's power that was, had an alien entity, two of them, that was tormenting her. I, I was when it got her out of prison. I was when it put her in the home of one of our people, uh, a medical doctor. And she married a, a young man that was a rice farmer. Last time I saw her, she had two children. And I asked her husband if there's anything abnormal about her. He said, absolutely not. That said, uh, she said that one time there was, and an American priest prayed for her, which was me, and, and, uh, and said, uh, uh, she has been well ever since.